In this episode of Detroit Performs, a self-taught singer-songwriter from Detroit pours her heart and soul into her music. An interdisciplinary artist working in performance, video, print, sculpting, and installation. And a painter, curator, and punk rock musician describes her journey as an artist and social activist. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm DJ Oliver and welcome back to Detroit Performs. Today's show is all about strong women in the arts. I'm at the Review Gallery in Detroit, whose owner happens to be an incredible female herself, Simone de Sosa. Our first female artist is self-taught singer, songwriter, and musician, Audra Kubat, whose love for Detroit and the people of the city runs strong in the depths of her lyrics and the way she gives back to the community. I grew up in uh, Rosedale Park in the west side of Detroit and when I was little we had a piano so I used to just make up songs or I could hear melodies you know and then go and I could figure out how to play them right away just by ear. I didn't really start writing songs or anything until I was out of high school. Much later I got a guitar and started writing songs. I think it was something healing in the process for me. I would work through issues through writing the songs and I'd feel better after. It was kind of like what crying can do for people sometimes. Um, my first songwriting influence was Joni Mitchell. Her writing was always very honest because I don't think she was like, oh, well, I can't say that. She was like, nope, I can say that. I can say whatever comes to me. I don't think she judged herself. So that was empowering to hear, I mean, especially a female artist. I write a lot of, about a lot of different subjects. I write about people, but I mean, they're always kind of like trying to find um, the hope in it, you know, most of my songs kind of start out um, kind of talking about what the problem is, talking about the things that are, that need addressing. You wrecked yourself again, just trying to stop the pain. But like sort of three-fourths through the song, it's kind of like, oh, but it could be like this, it could be like that. And, and it kind of goes through this process of seeing these people, they're having a hard time, and, and then it, at the end, it's kind of like, yeah, but it could be different. The dreamers, they're awake. They rise, they can't believe. I think when you get to those low points, that's when something breaks in you. That's when you make a, a, a choice, and you know, hard choices happen in those times. And then when you come back from that, you're stronger. You've built up an immunity to it. And the stars can guide. And when you get there, the next time something happens that's trying to put you back down there, you're kind of ready for it. You've built up your strength towards it. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to go that far down anymore. But I think if you go through life and you've not, you haven't had those things, you're actually missing out, you know, because I just think that they're really important to like develop really strong and amazing people. I am really sensitive to things outside of me, so it's like hard for me to see people hurting or in pain. So a lot of it started because I wanted to make things better around me because it was hard for me to live through it. So I wanted to change people, <laughs> I guess. I hope that it's inspirational. I think that the music is trying to be as vulnerable as possible and as open as possible so that I hope that when you're listening to it, it makes you feel like that somebody's with you somebody understands and that we're all actually so much more alike than we are different and so that it brings us together, <laughs> I guess. What I think a lot of people need is just the encouragement to, to believe in what they're saying. I want to help young people and really everybody, young at heart also, just everyone to spend time with music 
and to remind them that they are all storytellers. One of the greatest things I'm doing right now is working with young people and um, working with songwriting and performance. And you know, not all of these students are going to be musicians. Most of them will be doing something else, but it's the confidence that you build through having people listen to you talk, having people listen to your story. We are all storytellers. And so I, I hope to remind people that they have a gift and then I'm ready to hear it. And sometimes it just takes a good ear, you know, a, a patient ear to change the whole life of a young person. Doing songwriting with a school downtown called Dime and just the challenge of teaching songwriting, and especially in a world where pop music is, that's what young people, I mean, I think probably think that they have to do to become you know, popular and known. And I just wanted to say that part of what I hope to bring to my songwriting students is a different vantage point. That it's like you can incorporate hooks in your songs and you can incorporate things that, that have pop sensibility without sort of compromising your, your story. And so that's something that I hope to be able to work with them and I try to do that in my own music. It's like I don't want my songs to be stale and I don't want them to not have some pop sensibility. And I think what happens is out in the world with pop music is like the writing isn't there, but the pop sensibility is there. So the songs are going to be popular because they're fun and they're, they have good rhythm and they have a good hook. Just think about taking that formula and adding like really powerful, uplifting, inspirational lyrics to it with the pop sensibility. Like that's a good song to me. That Those are the kind of songs and the kind of songwriters that I would like to help encourage. You know, and that's the kind of songwriter I want to be. Because I do, I think my songs, some of them are toe-tapping. I think what's most important about living in Detroit is um, saying hello to people. I find that nothing, you know, ever really terrible happened to me here. And I've always addressed people. I've always looked them in the face and said hello. You have to be with the people that, you're, that are on the street with you and, and not be afraid, you know. Put on a good face. This city, you know, despite uh, what people may think um, has a lot to show. Currently, I'm, I host an open mic at Union Street. It's down on Woodward across the Majestic Cafe. And I host an open mic there every Tuesday at nine o'clock. And um, so I open up the night and I play some of my songs. And then we have a, a great group of young and uh, established songwriters and poets sometimes to all kinds of different people doing different things but um, that come down and share their work with each other and it's become a really vibrant sort of jewel I think. There is not a dud in the group. There's just, I mean, Mike Galbraith, um, Allison Lewis, uh, Michelle Held, Emily Rose, incredible singer-songwriters that will blow your mind come to this open mic and we always have a featured guest and so I'm constantly trying to bring in somebody new to share their work and it's awesome. I think it says that you know come down here and see it for yourself. It's just very telling when you can come down and you can see the talent that's here. I want you to come down and support this beautiful culture that's happening and be a part of it because it's going to continue to grow and what's so special is when you can be a part of that. You can learn more about Audrey Kubat and all the artists you'll see here on DetroitPerforms.org. Multimedia artist Melanie Manos held an exhibition right here at the Review Gallery this past summer. Let's take a look at her art, how it came about, and what it all means. I feel like creativity is such an important outlet, and I'm not sure how to say how it is, but just the doing of it put you into a different place, mentally. I was born in Detroit and raised in Girls Point, Michigan, Girls Point Farms. And um, both my parents are Detroiters. My early training is in music, theater and dance. And, but along the way, I um, definitely always took to art that we did in school and um, drawing. I did a year at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts West which is in Pasadena. Um, but then I transferred to UCLA and really wanted to get in more into academics. 
And while I was there, um, really kind of started to immerse myself into the art scene there, which was really thriving. And um, it was a time of um, really conceptual work, um, a lot of work that takes time to try to understand what's going on. Very, you know, wow, what is this? This is not, you know, um, this is not cubism. This is not abstract <laughs> expression. This is something totally different. And so I found that I really connected with artists and musicians um, more than actors. So the theater started to go away, but I still had all that training. And so what I did was I formed a performance art group with um, an artist named Laura Howe, and we called it Too Much Girl. A lot of it was just um, writing down things that uh, occurred to us that were bothering us. It was sort of a, 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 a social political venting you could say, but we you know, had a feminist bent. It was also sometimes very personal, like we would write things about how ridiculous it was. We would spend, an, it was called Can't Get Dressed. We'd spend an hour and we still hadn't gotten dressed for something. And it was just like a self-parody, like how stupid is this? <laughs> I can't get dressed. And then I just started developing my own work and moving more individual and sometimes doing performance. But you know, eventually Too Much Girl, we kind of ended it and then um, started doing shows more with painting, actually. Um, I think I like the having the, the introverted time of working in the studio, but then the extroverted time where I'm doing something that's either a performative piece or more of a community-based kind of piece where you've got interaction with, um, with a group or a community. With this show that right now I'm doing, I've been working with the idea of I think a lot of it comes down to, as a performance artist, I was working, for, using myself and using the body. And I'm petite, I guess you could say, or diminutive. And so I found myself desiring, for some reason, to climb into things, things that, and looking at their interstitial. So why is that space there? What is that space for? I need to get in and, and experience it. So um, I've got some digital prints. I'll take those photos and then I'll work on them like in Photoshop and do some collage work. Like one, it looks like aspects of myself are helping myself reach something. Um, and then there's another one I call it self-reliance where I'm climbing uh, on top of myself essentially. So I'm sort of asking people to look at that in-between space and to consider sort of the feeling of spaces. Um, However, sometimes um, or often it becomes very site or place specific. What I'm conveying is having people think about themselves, their bodies, sort of to experience. We sort of forget we kind of were so in our heads. And with this current show, um, it's the same kind of thing where I'm responding to the space of the gallery at Review Contemporary. So this was a building that was built like in 19, I think 17. And it has, like that era was like Albert Kahn, where he was kind of known for those big cement uh, columns. So um, I was doing a residency at the McDowell Art Colony in New Hampshire over the um, like December, January. And there's these beautiful, huge trees. So you just open up your studio and, and look out the window and these huge, you know, monumental trees. And I started thinking, I've got to do some drawings about these trees. Then I start thinking about how do I want to convey this. I want to do it on vellum. I want it to be charcoal. And I think I wanted this, this sort of an ethereal feel. I was thinking they were going to be like scrolls. And then the, and the light would sort of come through them. And the scale of them uh, I felt was interesting it, proportionally to working with these mini versions of me climbing these. This effort, the, the human effort. And we all work so hard, you know, it seems like. And um, um, this, the idea of perseverance. And I was also thinking about that a lot for Detroit. Like, you just have to persevere. It's gone through such hard times. And so I like to convey that, but with a, you know, like a spoonful of absurdity. I do like to have humor in my work. So with the, the scale of these pieces, going back to this review gallery, I'm thinking, I make these huge trees and then you see this like Lilliputian figure trying to get up that tree. I think also about the um, kind of our hubris as humans that we just 
own the world, we conquer the world, and you know, we overtake nature. In some ways, again, going kind of going back to hubris and those those whimsical drawings, they're kind of fun, but the like the the underside of them is like thinking about. I mean, we all have to live somewhere, and so of course, you know, builders and uh, urban planners create these communities, but um, sometimes they be I feel like everyone's on top of each other <laughs> you know and I can I definitely kind of feel like the world's overpopulated and um, there's just this idea about this and this this fabricated world where we get kind of kind of removed from nature and then we have our landscapes so you'll see all the little landscapes in there I'm not a political commentator I wish I did have that kind of um, but I definitely have political feelings I have social feelings, and for me, I try to put, bring it into the art. But again, I do it through, my way is a little bit more humorous, working with the absurd. To find out more about Melanie Manos and all of the Detroit Perform artists, art events, and art programs, head to DetroitPerforms.org. And now, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around Detroit. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ixity.com. Stephanie Rond is a painter, curator, and punk rock musician. She describes herself as a feminist painter and often incorporates messages from 1950s advertising in her work. Up next, we hear about her journey as an artist and social activist. I actually got started in art probably in 10th grade is when I became very serious about it. I've always been into art. That's where I felt like my voice was strongest. I always like a new challenge of how to say what I want to say in a new way. I use paints that are man-made. There's something about the aesthetic of that plastic quality that I am drawn to. And I also do a lot with old advertisements from the 50s. It's already something that's in our culture, and I like taking that and making a new story with it. I researched probably thousands of 50s ads to find the ones that I wanted to use. To me, that search helps bring in the story. With the new work that I'm doing, it's very text involved. I was in a punk rock band for five years, and that kind of changed what I thought about the written word as a way to get people to start the story where I want them to start the story in my paintings and then jump off from that text. I have been a feminist painter for the past probably 17 years. I feel like that's where my voice is in my artwork is um, talking about the inequalities that still exist between men and women. Discussing gender and humor go together because I want people to be comfortable with the artwork right away and then kind of see that there's an underlying topic there. So I've always been interested in the female aspect of art making and, and the idea of handmade craft and thinking about like women's work and how women have been making artwork forever. It's not really considered an art form. I really like the idea of the labor behind lace or cross-stitch or embroidery. Street art and graffiti is actually the other half of the artwork that I'm making right now. That's a very male-dominated art still, but I like taking the styles that they're using and incorporating it into my work. So it's kind of two separate things that talk to each other. If I can make artwork where people can have discussions about inequality, it doesn't matter race, gender, sexual preference, we should all be considered equals. I enjoy making art spaces where they don't exist. 
to kind of give quality back to the community. There's definitely an art to putting a show together and making sure that this piece that's next to this piece is talking correctly. The first place I started curating at was the Carnegie Gallery, which is at the main library. And they had built a gallery, but they weren't putting art in there. So I asked to start getting nonprofits to come in and have shows. With 2,000 people coming into the library every day, that's a huge audience. The kind of art that I bring to the Carnegie are actually large organizations, large nonprofits. For example, the Ohio Art League or Roy G. Bibb. And what we do there is we put out a call for entry and we will have 40 to 50 artists look at a theme to go into the show. Holy Craft is actually a newer venture. It is a handmade goods store. It's actually part of the DIY, kind of the punk rock culture. It goes along a lot with my artwork. It's got a lot of wit and humor. It's not your grandmother's craft store. We wanted to have this gallery because there isn't much difference between craft and art, so it was just a natural progression to put art and craft together. Some of the challenges that I face working as an artist today is the economy. The art world's getting very hit by that. People don't realize that it's not a luxury, that it's a necessity. It is what we are as human beings. It's how we communicate with each other. It's about human expression. Anybody should have the right to be able to express themselves. To find out more about Stephanie Rond and all the others found here today, check out DetroitPerforms.org. As we've seen on Detroit Performs, the city is a treasure trove of artistic talent and gifted minds, and painter and relief sculptor Gilda Snowden fits perfectly in that mold. Sadly, Ms. Snowden passed away not too long ago. It's only fitting we pay homage to her. Here she is in a segment taped in October 2003 for Detroit Public TV's Art Beat, hosted by Rob Maniscalco. What a wonderful studio space you've created in here. This is going to be a lovely one. I love this space. Yeah, this yes. is a really good work place to do art. I've been here for five years. Uh, prior to that, I was in Harmony Park. Mm -hmm. And I moved here because I needed the light and the space. And, but all of um, this. Yeah, the, the ability it's to... It's like a kid in a candy store. Lay all my, my things out, to have mm. my work and my paints here. And then these, these walls, which I had built. Mm -hmm. And so now I should go over here and get this work. I want right. to show you some work yeah. that uh, I've been doing um, recently. Here's a piece that I had at the Cast Cafe in the, the Lorca show, which was a collaboration between myself and my husband, William Boswell. He translated um, the Romancero Gitano series of paintings by Federico Garcia Lorca. I read the the um, translations, and then I responded by doing these paintings. Right. Let's just set that one there. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. And this is a part of a, a mini series called the Sea of Made and Broken Promises. All of the paintings, the titles of the paintings, were lines from the poetry. Yeah. And so that's where I drew from. That's what I began to bounce off from. Mm -hmm. And I found a shape that I wanted to uh, repeat. And then I use the physicality of the paint in order to um, help flesh out the negative spaces and give a kind of um, uh, visual crunch to the uh, the overall picture. Oh, wow! And then let's see what else you have here. We can put that here. Well, Be careful. I have lots of different things in here. Um, if you can follow me this way. Yeah. All right. What I'd like to show you is some of my earlier work that I have up, and I do that because I believe that my studio functions as a place of my own personal history. Mm -hmm. So I have the tornadoes, I have the sculpture, I even have several works of paintings and sculpture that I did when I was a student at Wayne State. And I like to be reminded of that work. I like to confront my past as much as possible. Yeah, well, it's all who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's interesting. You know, we all talk about our roots and our connection with our own history, and right. we all talk about the history of our, our culture that we come from and all that. Well, too. not only my own history, but you notice that I have a lot of books, and this only represents a portion of my library. So I have books on artists, on art history, and I use these 
in preparing for my classes at uh, CCS. Yeah. And this is some more work, and these are more of the tornado series of pictures, and also a series of landscapes that are from the tornadoes, because after all, tornadoes live in a landscape. Yes. Well, your tornadoes kind of include a little terrestrial as well as the sort of the center of the storm. Yes, I try to see as many different ways of utilizing that format as possible. Thank you, Gilda, for your art and soul. To find out more about Gilda Snowden and all of the other Detroit Reform artists, visit the Detroit Reform's website. I hope you've enjoyed today's celebration of women in the arts. There are definitely a ton more, and we promise we'll bring them to you in upcoming episodes. As for today's show, that wraps it up. For more arts and culture, head to DetroitReforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the Review Gallery for letting us come by here today and explore the exhibition of Timothy Van Lahr, and a big shout out to Wayne State print media professor, Pamela DeLora. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, MGM Grand Detroit, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.